They say, the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. When the thoroughbred world descends upon Lexington this November, there's one place you need to be, and that, of course, is at Keeneland. It's home to the 2022 Breeders' Cup, followed directly by the November Breeding Stock Sale at Keeneland. View the catalog online now at november.keeneland.com. Good afternoon. It's 12.55 in the East Coast on October 4th. This is the TDN Writers' Room, brought to you by Keeneland. I'm your host, Bill Finley, with a new cast of characters. Welcome in, Randy Moss and Zoe Cadman. Thanks, Bill. Glad to be here. Delighted be to fun. be here. Well, guys, the big story this week, and, and there were many big stories, but the big kerfuffle coming out of the Lucas Classic. And there's really two stories here. A great horse race for Hot Rod Charlie, kind of been an unlucky loser through his, uh, his career, came back with his great surge in the end, beat Rich Strike on the wire, Rich Strike running what I thought was maybe the best race of his career. But all anybody wants to talk about is Sonny Leone. What was going on in the stretch? Looked like he was trying to elbow Tyler Gaffleon. Was it rough riding? Randy Moss, your take on Sonny Leon Gate Saturday at Churchill Downs on Lucas Classic. Yeah, this was a race that we actually covered on NBC as part of our telecast on Saturday. And it was really a tale of two replays because we didn't have access at NBC Saturday to the stewards head on replay. First, you see the pan angle, the normal angle. And you see a fantastic horse race with Rich Strike taking the lead at the 16th pole, looking like he's going to go on to yet another victory at Churchill Downs. And then Hot Rod Charlie came battling back along the inside. You couldn't really see a whole lot else going on on the pan shot. Then afterward was sort of the video scene around the world. The Stewart's head on angle where you could see, Bill, exactly what you described. Leon bringing Rich Strike over toward Hot Rod Charlie. I think probably in a moment of panic, leaning over and uh, appearing to try to elbow Tyler Gaffleone in the final strides of the race. And of course, Hot Rod Charlie managing to get up to win anyway. And as they galloped out, you could see Gaffleone sort of look over at, uh, at Sonny Leone almost with an amused look on his face. I have a feeling it, it wouldn't have been an amused look if Rich Strike had managed to win the photo. But look, it, he was given a 15-day suspension by Churchill Down stewards. Kudos to the stewards for not falling for what, in my opinion, was a completely bogus excuse that Leon came with about the saddle slipping. Um, first of all, if, if the saddle had indeed slipped, okay, uh, it's ironic that it would have slipped only in the final strides of the race when Hot Rod Charlie is coming back along the inside. Then you see the gallop out afterward and you see Rich Strike coming back to be unsaddled. No evidence there of any kind of saddle slip. If indeed the saddle did slip in the last stages of the race, I think it was the result of Sonny Leon leaning over and trying to elbow Gaff Leon and not the other way around. Look, he deserved the suspension. Uh, if it was me and I was a Churchill Down steward, he'd be on vacation for the rest of the year. I would have given him at minimum two months and maybe even three months. I think it's inexcusable. He's got a history of rough riding. Remember, after he won the Kentucky Derby, he immediately started a suspension. It was his fourth since September then. Uh, I just think there's no place for anything like this at all. And we're fortunate that it ended the way it did. And we didn't see, uh, you know, Gaff Leon lose his balance on Hot Rod Charlie. Zoe, what do you think? And I think a, a lot of the takeaway has been we're forgetting what a great race that Hot Rod Charlie actually had. I think maybe over the years, especially the last few races, maybe he's just been unlucky. Maybe he does try every single time because he really wanted to prove that he was the best horse on the day. Now, had Rich Strike stayed straight, he may well have gone by. I have no doubt in my mind that Sonny Leon did steer this horse down into Rich Strike. I also do believe that the saddle did slip. But the only reason it slipped is because Sonny was like doing this and elbowing. And when your weight is all the way over on one side, of course, the saddle's going to slip. And then I think he righted it. There are definitely some pictures when you can see that he is completely off balance and over the wrong side of the horse. And I think that split second instant is where the saddle did slip. But it was caused specifically because he was leaning over and trying to 
basically ride Hot Rod Charlie as well. So, I mean, it, it's a bit of both, but I think ultimately the stewards made the right decision. And 30 days, yes. And think back to Mo Donegal, last year's Remsen. I actually just watched that this morning, and that was really bad. And Irad got his 30 days. So, I mean, it's it's about the same infraction there because Irad steered Mo Donegal all the way down. And Zoe, let me interrupt for a second because – you just said it's the same infraction, but they gave Irad 30 days. They only gave Sonny 15. It's different and as an ex yeah, I, I know. Have, I know. You're going to have a great opinion on this. But to me, it goes beyond, you know, whether or not he costs Rich Strike the race. Isn't he, isn't he putting Tyler Gaffleone in jeopardy? I mean, Gaffleone could have been seriously injured here and we could have had a catastrophe. I'm with Randy. I would have given him at least six months. I think the stewards went too easy on him. Your thoughts? Well, I think the problem has been over the course of the last couple of years that these jocks are getting away with it. You know, when Irad got 30 days, he probably should have got 60. I mean, what he did on Mo Donegal the day before, he dropped the jock. And that's what gave him the penalty, he dropped the bug boy. So I think the stewards in all jurisdictions need to start coming down a lot harder, a lot heavier on these guys. Don't let these guys run ride in designated races. Oh, yeah, you get 30 days. Oh, you can ride in a grade one race. Well done. Here's your reward. Like if you get days, you should be able to, you should have to take them. You shouldn't be allowed to ride in graded stakes if you are mm -hmm. on a suspension. Right. Now we had a similar incident with Christophe Simon in France, which we're going to talk about later, yeah. Randy. Now we've seen the, we've seen Irad do things like this. We've seen Paco Lopez on numerous occasions uh, put what his fellow riders thought was, you know, putting them into jeopardy. Uh, during the running of a race, uh, I, I I agree with Zoe. I, I think something's got to be done about this. I would have given, again, I would have given, uh, I would have given him the Churchill Lounge Bob Baffert treatment, right? Uh, maybe <laughs> not that draconian, maybe <laughs> not two years, but um, yeah, I kudos to them for giving them more than like the one week standard suspension, right. a three week suspension. But I, I think they could have, and I would have gone a lot more uh, heavy duty on that. So, Randy, let's get back to the race itself and Zoe touched on it. If this didn't happen, and like you said, if we were only looking at the pan shot, then we're looking at a terrific horse race. And I thought the story was Rich Strike, even a little bit more so, Zoe, than Hot Rod Charlie, because to me, this horse still had to prove himself. I know he ran well in the Travers, but he was fourth. And to me, he was still the 80 to 1 shot that won the Kentucky Derby with a Sonny Leone, great ride, perfect trip, pace meltdown. I thought this was the best race of his career. I thought it was even better than his Kentucky Derby, considering a couple things. First of all, he was running against older horses for the first time in a pretty salty field. You know, it wasn't a big race field-wise, size-wise. There's some really nice horses in there, like Hot Rod Charlie, like uh, Happy Saver, et cetera. And he really showed up, probably would have won the race if this incident didn't happen. The other thing, Randy, I liked about him, what happened to the rich strike that comes from 20 lengths behind? <laughs> he was fourth early, two and a half lengths off the pace, I believe in the half mile call. That's going to serve him well. I hate horses that come from 20 lengths behind because they're always pace dependent. He ran like a different horse in the course of the race. I thought it was the best race of his career. And I think Eric Reed has every reason to be very happy about it. And looking forward, he's already talked about how good this horse is going to be as a four-year-old. I think he's right. You know, Eric kept telling us after the Kentucky Derby, he kept insisting, this horse actually has speed. And we just kind of laughed you know, as, as far right. back as he was in Kentucky. But obviously, the horse does have uh, a few more chops during the first part of a race than he showed at Churchill Downs. Look, I really liked his race in the Travers. He wasn't going to beat Epicenter, but I thought he was the second best horse in that race because Sonny Leon actually started the engine at about the four and a half pole and was in a full on ride at the half mile pole. With Rich Strike moving that early, and yet the horse was still digging, digging, digging for the final quarter of a mile and ran pretty well. So I expected him to give a really good showing of himself on Saturday. Did I expect him to run as well as he did? Uh, maybe not, but I agree he definitely did uh, prove that he's for real. He really did. I mean, then there's no question that he loves Churchill Downs. He's almost, almost undefeated at Churchill Downs. But I pose a question, does Sonny Leon stay on? Do we get a new rider? 
Well, so far, there hasn't been a change. We haven't heard anything from the connection. So we'll wait and see uh, if they do make a change. Eric Reid has seemed pretty loyal to him all along. So we'll find out about that. All right, we thought the big story of the week was going to be life is good. Turned out nobody's even talking about him winning the Woodward. And I, I got to admit, look, at one hand, you look at this horse. He's won three grade ones this year. If flight line didn't exist, he'd be the leading contender for the horse of the year. But you know what? At one to 20, not even one to 10, one to 20 going against three rivals, I certainly expect a lot more than a, what was it, a length and a half win, where at one point in the race, it looked like he might actually be in jeopardy of winning. And Randy, your team with the buyers gave him a 97 buyer figure. He's going to have to run a lot faster than that, not only to win the Breeders' Cup Classic, but to be competitive in the Breeders' Cup Classic. Now, you could make one argument that it was just a paid public workout. I get it. But you know what? I was expecting more from him, to be honest. Randy? I I don't think a matchup with flight line at a mile and a quarter at Keeneland in the Breeders' Cup Classic is going to end well for life is good. Okay. Having said that, I do think that his Woodward was a little better than the 97 buyer speed figure would indicate. And here's why. The the horse had shown a tendency in his two-turn races, okay, going back to the Pegasus World Cup, to the Dubai World Cup, um, or was it Saudi Arabia? Anyway, one of the two. Uh, yeah. And then the, uh, the most recently in the, in the Whitney of running off down the backstretch with Ired Ortiz, really aggressively at about the three-quarter pole, taking off down the backstretch and using up a lot of valuable energy at that point in the race. And it showed in the closing stages of his race, in the Pegasus, he ran the final quarter in 26.38. In the Whitney, he ran the final quarter in 25.57. Pletcher made it a point during the lead up to the Woodward to try to get the horse to settle a little bit and to tell Irad going into the Woodward, the same thing, you know, try not to let him run off down the backstretch. If anything, I think it worked too well. I think the horse was too relaxed during the early part of the race. If you look at the internal fractions, it was a lot slower than he had been running early on in those races. And as a result, when Law Professor ran up to him and gave him that scare at the quarter pole, right? Life is Good was able to finish in 24 and one for the final quarter mile. By far the fastest finish that he had had in any of those mile and an eighth races that he had run in the past. So I, I do think the race was better than the visuals would indicate and maybe better than the speed figure would indicate. But having said that, does that mean that, you know, he's going to stack up really well when flight line grabs him by the throat if that happens at the half mile pole or so in the Breeders' Cup? I don't think it will. Uh, I mean, I'm with you with everything you said, Randy, for sure. And the internal fractions were good for flight line. He did finish. Visually, it was workmanlike, but that's not, this was just a stepping stone to the Breeders' Cup Classic. And the old adage, never be afraid of one horse. Anything can happen the morning of the race. God forbid. I mean, I don't want anything to happen. I want it to be a terrific horse race. But unless you're entered, I know a lot of people are going to be saying, why doesn't he run in the dirt mile? What happens if flight line sick the morning of the race and you're in the dirt mile and it's up for grabs? I mean, you've got to be in it to win it. So I applaud them for still going for the classic because at the end of the day, it's a horse race and it's going to be a good one. Yeah, I, I talked to Todd before uh, before the Woodward. Uh, we had a phone conversation with him and I asked him, I said, look, you know, you've been you've had a lot of good horses. You've you know, you've been in this position a lot of times. And I know you still have the Woodward left to go, but in the back of the uh, of your mind, you kind of envision the Breeders' Cup Classic at Keeneland where you're in front, flight line is sitting right behind you in second, and what might happen? And he said, absolutely. He said, it, it's human nature. You can't help but think about that. And he said, our best hope, given how good flight line is, is that perhaps we can see, possibly see the same thing in the Breeders' Cup Classic as we saw when Olympiad was chasing Life is Good in the Whitney, right? Olympiad had uh, had been dominant, chasing horses that were inferior to him and looking like a world beater in the process. And then in the Whitney, when he had to try to chase Life is Good at the half mile pole and he tried and he couldn't really make any headway, he was like, oh, wait a second. 
And he he just basically gave up, I think, and, and, and Todd Pletcher thinks as well. The, the hope, at least, from the Life is Good camp is that when Flightline makes his run at Life is Good and suddenly, you know, he's not making his run at some of those horses that he's been having to run down in the past and he has to work a little bit harder to get there, that it might discourage him a little bit and we might see a surprising outcome. Right. I, mean, I think the lot the problem with that logic is that flight line is just a better horse than Olympiad. Yes, but you exactly. know, nice. It's nice for them to try. Okay, the other race of the weekend that we knew was going to have uh, produce horses for the Breeders' Cup Classic was the Awesome Again out at Santa Anita. My take on that is you have in the, of the older male dirt horses in California, you have a superstar and a bunch of really ordinary horses. Uh, Defunded, mm, boy, he was coming off a sixth place finish in a sprint race, kind of stole the race. I thought Country Grammar would run a lot better than he did. And I kind of wanted him to see him run better because I wanted him to, because I'm such a flight line loon, if flight line beats him by 19 and a quarter lengths and he comes back and wins the awesome again by five or six, what does that say about flight line? Well, again, I, I'm still a flight line loon, but I think what we learned is Pacific Classic, he beat fairly ordinary horses, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the top older horses in California uh, have been taking turns beating each other all year. Your country grammars, express trains, your royal ships, you know, there goes Harvard, wins one of them. Uh, and they're all pretty good races, and some of them are even better than pretty good. But, you know, I mean, in the end, in the awesome again, uh, those horses were disappointing. Uh, I thought country grammar, I agree, I thought he would run better than he did. And Baffert is now talking about not even trying to run against Flightline in the Breeders' Cup Classic. Of course, he has Taba, uh, the three-year-old, pointing for that race as well. And maybe he thinks the country grammar is not as good as Taba. He thinks he's kind of going in the wrong direction. Uh, Express Train, when he came out of the Californian, uh, he had to have some extra time because he was body sore. And he didn't run in the San Diego because John Sheriffs didn't like the way he was training. He obviously is not the same horse. Royal Ship went in the wrong direction. Uh, defunded is just not good enough, right? I mean, he's, I think he's better than the betters gave him credit for at five to one, uh, because he ran really well in the Hollywood Gold Cup at a mile and a quarter to finish second. Then he ran in the San Diego and caught a very deep rail that gave him absolutely no chance. And then he was thrown into a sprint race for the first time since early in his career. And he just didn't do very good chasing into sprint fractions. When he's able to control the pace like he did on Saturday, he's good enough to beat those kind of horses if things go his way. But I think the main story here is that none of those horses uh, look like they're likely to go on and uh, and ship out to Keeneland for the right to run against flight line and life is good. Yeah. And defunded, quite frankly, is just really good at Santa Anita. He's a very good workhorse. He works superbly at Santa Anita and he likes the track. So, you know, it'll be up to Bob to see if he wants to send him there or not. You know, you know another cool storyline is about that race, I think, Uh the three amigos, right? The oh, owners, wow. Mike Begram, Carl Watson, Paul Whiteman. Of course, you know, they've been around for a long time. They had Midnight Loot and, of course, Mike Pegram well before that with, with Real Quiet. They've kind of taken a back seat in the Baffert barn over the last 10 years or so, you know, with American Pharaoh and with Justify and the Avengers group spending these millions and millions and millions of dollars for these high-priced two-year-olds and yearlings. Uh, but this year, it's been a renaissance for the three amigos. They not only defunded, but they've got a whole barn full of, of really good two-year-olds, including the favorite for the American Pharaoh coming up on Saturday. So it's kind of cool to see those guys back in the limelight. It, it's really cool to see them back in because I think they had three stakes winners, the last three stakes winners that they had. Neither one cost more than 260000 So Donato Lani, who buys a lot of Bob's horses, he also buys for the Avengers, is finding these horses for the three amigos. And, you know, Bob is right in there with them. And it's, it's going back to their roots, basically, because these are the guys who Bob started with right from the very, very beginning. I mean, it is love or hate Bob Baffert. This is a cool story that he's going back to his roots and his roots have been there all along. Just a reminder, it's Full Stars All-Star Weekend this Keeneland. 11 stakes worth more than $5.5 million. Nine of those races are Breeders' Cup win and your in contest. We're also just a month away from the Keeneland sale. that starts on November the 7th, right after the Breeders' Cup. And I know a lot of those really fantastic race mares will be headed to the Keeneland sale, including multiple grade one winner Juju's Matt. 
When the thoroughbred world descends upon Lexington this November, there is one place you need to be. The place where history comes alive with every championship victory. He's off the deck indeed! The place where the future is built with the fall of a gavel. The place that exists to be the heart of this industry. The center of it all. Home to the November breeding stock sale and 2022 Breeders' Cup, Keeneland. Maximum security proves he's the real deal with a gate to wire win in the Florida Derby. Champion three-year-old. Maximum security has won the TBG.com Haskell Invitational. 11 triple digit bias. Maximum security. He smoked them in the cigar mile. Grade one winning four-year-old. Maximum security takes them all the way in the TBG Pacific Classic. Secure your mayor's future. Maximum security. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Coolmore. Ashford Sire Practical Joke got two new grade one winners over the weekend. And Randy, I know you are a big fan of chocolate gelato, both the horse <laughs> and the pudding. How good was she over the weekend in the grade one frisette? I think I like the horse a little more than I like the pudding. Uh, eight and a half <laughs> length maiden win, and she followed that up with that win in the frisette at Belmont at Aqueduct on Sunday on a sloppy racetrack. I think that stamps her as one of the leading contenders right now going into Keeneland for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. And, hey, if it rains at Keeneland, she's proven she can handle it, Bill. Now, I, I want to know, is calling gelato pudding like an English thing? Zoe, I've never heard that before. Yeah, it's pudding. It's pudding. Of course it's pudding. No, it's I mean, gelato. Yeah, it can be dessert as well. Pudding but, is what uh, Bill Cosby used to eat on those old ads before he wound up in jail. <laughs> I'm not sure he really wants to his name anymore. Right. <laughs> Okay. See, now I learned something. You always learn something on the Thoroughbred Daily News Writers Room. Now I know what pudding means to people in England. Now, the big story in Europe this weekend was not pudding. It was, of course, the Arc de Triomphe. And, and uh, Zoe, you talked about Alpinista before the race, your affinity for Sir Mark Prescott, who you worked for before. I don't follow European racing all that closely, but I gather people were very happy to see this mayor win for one of the reasons why Prescott is very well liked and they were hoping that he would get his first arc win. Zoe, tell us more about the story of Alpinista. I mean, it's just a massive story. Kirsten Rousing has had five generations of family. She brought the first one back in 1985. So Mark has trained them all, Alborado, Alpinista, Albedora. They all begin with Al and there's been five generations and the fact that this mayor in Sir Mark's 53rd year of training, he is the longest serving trainer in Newmarket, wins the art. I don't think there's a single person other than perhaps the poor sods that work for him back at Heath House that basically work night and day because I've been one of them that wasn't happy for Sir Mark and the team and Kirsten Rousing. It really was a phenomenal performance on boggy, boggy ground. I mean, the second place finisher was good. We saw Tocato Tasso run third. So he basically, it wasn't a fluke last year when he won, but it really was a fantastic day of racing. And there is not one person that wasn't happy for Samarka. Perhaps his long, long serving, suffering assistant, William, because Samarka's been threatening to retire for years and he just has, he's just never going to retire now. Randy, your take on the arc? Oh, it looks like we're not going to get any of the uh, the top finishers coming over from the arc to the Breeders' Cup. Maybe we'll get some of the also rans. It remains to be seen. A lot of that doesn't get decided until you know right before the planes leave Europe to come over here for the Breeders' Cup. Uh, we might get a couple of fillies coming out of the Prix de la Opera uh, to run in the Philly and Mare Turf. That was one of the the historic undercard races for Longchamp. Um, but you know, going in to the arc, okay, one of the one of the big storylines was the fact that Christophe Soumillon was going to be actually allowed to ride. He winds up riding in the arc on a horse called Vidini, and is a is a very strong second, getting beat just a half length. Uh, but Bill, what we saw from Soumillon in France was very similar to what we saw from Sonny Leon Saturday at. at um, at Belmont at Aqueduct, except it ended uh, much more dramatically. Yeah, so let's go back to the story. It was Friday at San Clude, and Sumion was riding a horse in a grade three stakes race, group three stakes race. A jockey by the name of Rosa Ryan, who I've never heard of, Zoe might be more familiar, than was outside of him. And Sumion, yeah, he won he, 
above and beyond what even our friend Sonny Leon did. He elbowed the jockey and knocked him off the horse. And the suspension was not only was it just 60 days, and just as I said that um, Sonny Leon deserved a more serious suspension or longer suspension, uh, he was able to ride in the arc. They didn't let the suspension, but that, those were the, the, the rules that were in place at that point that they wouldn't start till after the weekend, I guess maybe because entries were already taken for the race, uh, that sort of thing. But again, you know, talk about Zoe. What he, what could have happened? The horse was okay and the jockey he knocked out of the saddle was okay. But this again could have been a catastrophe. And I don't know Kristen, uh, Christoph Somalian at all. I don't know the first thing about him, but this was a really egregious offense. Um, and I would have given him at least again, at least a year. The French stewards seem to be doing the same thing that they're doing in the United States. They're not sending enough of a message that safety comes first and you cannot pull stunts like this. And if you do, you're going to be set down for a long, long time. Absolutely. And he did a move that has worked for him in the past. But anytime you're racing horses at 30 miles an hour, you've got your toes in the stirrups, any slight elbow or jostle can knock you off balance. And that's exactly what happened to Ross Ryan. He apologized frenetically afterwards. Um, I'm not sure what Ross had to say for it, but thank goodness that he was OK. Um, Sumion has lost his job with the Aga Khan over this. He did get to ride Vadini in the arc. Thank goodness he didn't win. He was second. And it looks like Vadini will stay in training and try for next year's arc, whether Sumion rides him or not. I, I don't really know. But, you know, they made an example of him. They gave him the two months and basically closed the book on him for the rest of the year. And, and quite rightly so. It happens a lot. Um, there was an article, I think, this morning in the racing, racing post, another jockey saying that this is a move. He just did it wrong. You know, so these oh, wow. are moves that jocks make in races. And you we've seen it time and time again. People got enough horse, they'll barge their way through there. And that's exactly what he did. Well, Zoe, let me ask you as a rider. I don't know if anybody's, I doubt anybody's ever literally elbowed you off the horse. But how often do these sort of things maybe not quite as egregious, but how often do they happen where jocks are, you know, jostling one another, pushing one another, maybe a little elbow here and there? Does it happen more than the public might know? Oh, every day, every single day. If a you're little. stuck on the rail and you've got horse, you're going to get through. I mean, it, it, different jurisdictions take different lights on it, but it, it happens every day. And for people not to see it, I think the stewards need to start coming down hard on these jocks. I mean, I've jumped heels before on horses. I mean, you can jump heels to get out of situations, but it, yes, it happens. And especially in Green. Europe where they ride a whole lot tighter. You can hear horses clipping heels. If you stand on the rail at Longchamp, you'll hear clickety, 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 clack. And these jocks know exactly how close they can get and not go down. Like it's amazing that more don't go down. But that's just how close and compact. Half the jocks over here, if they rode in a 30 horse field at Longchamp, would be absolutely terrified because they just ride very, very close. So in America, what we typically see would be in turf racing where they're bunched up and you get a rider, let's say, who's on a four to five or a three to five shot at the top of the stretch and he's boxed in behind horses and he's got to get out and he just broadsides a horse next to him and bulls out and, and makes room for himself. When you see the head-on replay of the Sumion incident, uh, both those horses are at the back of the pack, and it looked as if Sumion was trying to force his way out to get some room, except in this case, he didn't just broadside the horse. He reaches over, and he elbows Ross and Ryan at the same time and apparently caught Ryan a little bit off balance. The scary part, when you look at the still photos, Ross and Ryan actually hits the ground face first, and his body is contorted up in the air behind him, he's very lucky when you see that photo, the way he landed, that he's not looking at spending the rest of his life in a wheelchair. Because we've seen uh, much less severe looking incidents than this uh, cause uh, some some pretty catastrophic outcomes. So the one know, thing that see, amazed me did apologize, for Ryan's yeah. very lucky. The one thing that did amaze me is usually if something like that happens, the egregious jock will know it's happened. The fact that Sumion didn't even look over, like he elbowed him, so he knew he created contact. And you can hear, like if someone falls off, there's going to be a squeak. There's going to be some kind of noise. Like you are going to know 
like riding races, you know when something's happened behind you, you can hear it. And jocks make noise. Like people don't realize the amount that you can hear out there. So he will have heard it and didn't look over. And there is no way he didn't know that something, maybe he didn't know the guy fell off, but something, usually you will take a look over and be like, oh, oh, oh dear. Something like that. That That is what boggles my mind. Right. Um, going back to the card on the the Art Day card, a thing that we should mention, um, there was something we don't we'll, don't ever see and probably never will see in U.S. <laughs> racing. A two year old won the Prix La Bay. The name escapes me at the point. Oh, Zoe, I hope that you're, you're up on that. But uh, tell us a situation where a two year old can beat older horses in a Group One race. It's fantastic. I don't think it's happened uh, since maybe the 1970s or something. Holly Doyle wrote, wrote the filly. The name is escaping me as we speak. Um, and she basically won the win in your in. Now, the win in your in is for the turf sprint, but she, of course, will be the win in your in in the juvenile turf sprint. And for a two-year-old filly, now, she was getting a huge break in weights, which does help these, but usually they're not even entered. For her to beat Elder like she did in the style she did it and the fact the ground was so testing was simply amazing. And Holly Doyle just rode her terrifically. Midland okay, Park I had to look this up. The name of the horse is the Platinum Queen, yes. uh, the one the Prix de la Bay. Now, somebody pointed out uh, something that's interesting. Um, if she were, usually the Prix de la Bay winner would go in the Breeders' Cup turf sprint, she's not eligible. Correct. Because the conditions of the race don't allow a two year old. It's for three year olds and up. Now, they do have that other race on the card, and I don't know what their plans are coming for the Breeders' Cup or not. They do have that Breeders' Cup juvenile turf sprint, but a horse that perhaps might even be one of the what would be one of the favorites in the Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint is not eligible to run in it because of her age. Like I said, two-year-olds beating older horses just does not happen in this country. The conditions for the Abbey are two-year-olds and up. Right. And there's a colossal weight break for two-year-olds mm -hmm. when they run against the older horses in the Abbey. But still, you just never see a two-year-old win that race. So fascinating. And if they come over... Midland Park Racing, those guys went absolutely nuts, and quite rightly so. They're a great group of guys, and they basically got this filly for peanuts, and uh, good luck to them. I hope they do come, and that seemingly is the plan. The TD and Riders Room is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association. The PHBA recently concluded a successful inaugural edition of the Pennsylvania Stallion Series. Lupe Preciado won the training title. The top three trainers received bonuses of $25,000, $15,000, and $10,000. Also, nominations for the 2023 Pennsylvania Sired, Pennsylvania Bred Two-Year-Old Stallion Series are now open. Next year's series is being expanded to run in three legs. Each leg has a race for two-year-olds and two-year-old fillies. Also, a $50,000 trainer bonus for the top three point-earning horses. We'll be right back after this message from the PHBA. Here in Pennsylvania, we're proud of our breeding program, the best in North America. But we're also proud to be leaders in this industry. The PA Horse Breeders Association is funding cutting-edge research at Penn Vet to detect gene doping in thoroughbreds. And we endorsed the SAFE Act to help protect the most vulnerable horses. Plus, we're pleased to support the aftercare programs set up by our horsemen's groups. Just a few of the reasons why you should join us in Pennsylvania, the premier place to breed and race. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by XBTV. The XBTV work of the week is Flightline. He is a perfect five for five, and you can see him working here. Five furlongs in a minute flat, under one labor. This is a horse who is just absolutely terrific, not only in the morning, but also the afternoon. I had a chance to catch up with trainer John Sadler to discuss the work. Just a nice, easy work for Flightline today. Uh, he's got a series of works leading up to the Breeders' Cup. 
today we didn't want to do too much we just wanted to cruise around there and he did that so um, very happy and look good doing that look like you were leading a cavalry charge there were a lot of horses out there john yeah well the the pattern is a lot of horses work on the weekends because we race friday saturday sunday so you see more works on the weekend um, and the weather's conditions were great today nice and cool a little bit overcast so it was a good day to work is it a is it a concern for you watching that many horses on the track at the same time as your champ yeah but i mean we're, we're blessed to have juan leva you know who knows how to stay away from trouble <laughs> <laughs> so we're always trying to get in the first first bunch of them before anybody falls off all right john thanks for your time you're welcome and now the Green Group Guest of the Week, sponsored by the Green Group, an accounting and tax consulting advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn how they can help you at www.greenco.com. Well, our special guest this week is Tim Martin, the trainer of Tyler's Tribe, an exceptional horse running on the Iowa Circuit 5 for 5 Lifetime. Tim, thanks for joining us. And let's go back to the beginning. You and your owner, Tom Lepic, found this horse for $34,000 at an Iowa sale. And the horse was by a first-time freshman crop sire in Sharp Azteca. Not a lot to go on. Not exactly the kind of horse you think might be one of the favorites in a Breeders' Cup race. What did you see in this guy to make you go in for the $34,000? And what were you expecting? Well, uh, uh, we bought him on his looks. Uh, I was looking for, uh, when I were bred with Tom Lepic, we've been partners before, and, and I was, we were looking for an Iowa bred. And he sent me a picture of this horse, Tyler's Tribe. When he sent me the picture, I'm like, wow. I said, this horse is, looks like a horse coming from Kentucky. He don't look like no Iowa bred. And so his urine picture was like something I hadn't seen in Iowa bred. So I told him, I said, let's go look at this horse. This is, uh, yeah, he's he's something to look at. So that's that's where it started is the picture that I don't know where he got the picture, the video of him, but it was outstanding when I saw it. I'm like, wow, Lee, what a horse. So there's where it was. So Tim, so okay, you buy the horse for thirty four thousand. Now you're gonna get his career started, right? You're at you're at Prairie Meadows for that four and a half furlong maiden race against Iowa breads. He's the favorite. He's five to two, but he's not a heavy, heavy favorite. What did you think you had at that point? Uh, I told Tom what happened is that boy, Tyler, is a grandson of Tom Lepic. And we named the horse after that grandson, Tyler. Uh, you probably know the story. So in the paddock, Tom Lepic told me, he said, hey, I talked to the stewards and asked him, said, Tyler's here. And if we don't win the race, can we get the picture? We're in the paddock. The horse already left. He said, can we get the picture with the uh, Tyler, my grandson? And the steward said, in the winter circle, said, yes. If you don't win, y'all can come get the picture with the <laughs> grandson. So I said, did you tell the jockey? He said, no. I said, well, let me tell you something, Tom. Uh, I hate to say, but I really believe when this race is over, we're going to be getting phone calls on this horse because, you know, you don't, don't want to brag him up, but this horse could run. I knew he could run a bunch. And I just told him, I said, I think we're getting phone calls on him. So that's kind of where it started. So when you watched him win by 16 and three quarters lengths in a four and a half furlong race, what did you think at that point? Well, I, I was shocked because I didn't want to run the horse short four and a half. I waited and I told Tom and I talked to Jockey. I said, I don't know about four and a half. It's a big horse. And she's like, oh, no, he can run short or long. And I said, you think he's got enough speed? Oh, yeah. She said, he's got speed. I said, well, I'll run four and a half. But when he went like that, I was, I knew he's a nice horse. I knew he could run a lot because when we was breezing him, she kept saying, these horses are, they're running. He's just galloping. She said, it's like he's not even trying. He just got such a long stride. So I, I knew that he was a nice horse, but I didn't know, you know, when he went by 16, three quarters going four and a half. I, it, yeah, it was, I was, uh, a little shocked <laughs> and fast too. He went 52 and one. So he wasn't, he was running. Well, Tim, definitely want to get back to more talk about his career, but let's segue to the story of the young man named Tyler, Tom Lepic's uh, grandson. Um, he has leukemia and that's one of the many reasons why your co-owner named the horse after him. Give us an update. How is he doing these days? And how much has this helped him in his recovery to have this wonderful horse named after him? Well, it's helped him a lot. And he's, he's uh, actually, He's he's free of 
cancer now, or however you want to say it. They took the port out of him a week or two ago, and he's he's really doing good. And so uh, they announced that the other day. He said they took the port out, and so he's he's cancer free right now. So that's a good thing. And and he's excited. He's there every time, all five races. He's been there, been the winner's circle, and and uh, it's been it's been good. So now spinning it forward, Tim, uh, you've got a horse who's five for five. His average winning margin is 12 lengths. I mean, you look at his past performances on paper, and it's just like almost hard to believe that a horse can be this dominant in every race. And now you're looking ahead to the Breeders' Cup. So how do you decide, first of all, which race to go into in the Breeders' Cup? Well, I'm 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 undecided, but I'm kind of leaning more uh towards the the short race just because the horse is I didn't get to run him nowhere. I had to stay in Iowa. I had some opportunities, but I had to stay in Iowa because of the fan, uh, Tyler and the classic night and, you know, the fans there. We kind of planned that. So I had got some offers to go somewhere else. I wanted to run him long before if I'm going to, you know, if I'm going to experiment with him, I'd like to do it before a big race. And I know he's fast and I know he's super fast and so I'm thinking more of taking the chance of the turf. And I think you'll like the turf because the family has got some pedigree, the dad, the mom, he's got some siblings that's running really good on the turf. So I know that he's fast and I know he can run short, long. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not. So it's just hard to stretch him out right now. Tim, when you have a horse like this, who's never been tested, do even, you know, how good he is, how good is he? We don't know how good he is. Uh, Every time the rider rides him, she just pulls up and she's like, I got more horse. He's not even running. So <laughs> that part, we don't know. We don't know. Cause she ever, every time she says that horse is, she said, he's got more left. He's got more. And so, so I don't know. I mean, she's hitting the last time the race before the, the, uh, the classic Iowa cradle, he went by 15 and a half lengths and Chris Shard brought a two-year-old in. He said, he told the agent said, I know that my horse can run. I don't know about Martin's, but. I don't know if he can beat him, but he can run. Well, he beat him 15 and a half lengths, and, and he was just – she hit him one time at the wire, and then people jumped like, why'd she hit that horse? I said, well, maybe she wants to teach him what a whip is because he – but he's just – he just takes off. He runs with him, and then when he gets to the lane, he just takes off. He just starts running. So uh, the other night we had planned to run – to stretch him out, like go the mile. I talked to Sturge, and – but she stood up on him at the wire, so – I never did a line on him what what you know what to do or what to to go long or or what to do with him on that because she just kind of stood up on him and I don't know if she understood me or not but anyway that's kind of what happened on that part. So Tim, you mentioned that you had offers to run him elsewhere. Uh, what about other types of offers? Now this is a obviously it's a horse with a fairly modest pedigree, although Sharp Azteca is off to a really fast start as a stallion. Uh, but you know Iowa bred. How much has the phone been ringing as this horse continues to win with big margins from people wanting to buy the horse from you? Yeah, we've had a lot of offers. I've had some good offers for him, uh, but I've never had in my career a horse like this, even close to this. And he's named after Tyler, and and I, we just kind of plan not to sell him. So really, it don't really matter the offer, what it, what they want to give. I've had some good offers on him, but. I just, we just planned not to sell him. We didn't, me and Tom talked about it and I said, Tom, I don't have to sell him either. And we don't have to sell him. Let's just run him. So I guilt him. Now everybody's saying, you guilt the horse. I said, I've had a lot of these horses. They ain't none of them ever been like this. So what am I going to do? He's a gilded. I said, we can do about just racing. <laughs> now you say good offers. Now, not don't name names or anything. And I know you wouldn't, but give us a ballpark. What, when you say good offer, what are you, what, what are you talking about? So oh, I've had a couple of fives, 500. So, I mean, I'll, you know, half a million. So I went day, but I mean, I just, I didn't, I'm not, I'm not wanting to sell him. If you offer a million dollars, we're not even interested. Me or Tom, which not want to sell him. Wow. So we're having fun. And I've always said, or I've heard you can't put a price on fun. So mm -hmm. 
Very good. Hey, Tim, an, another part of this story is your jockey, Kylie Jordan. Um, she's not familiar to too many people, perhaps outside of Prairie Meadows. She was the leading rider at the meet, um, but she was up till about a month or a month and a half ago, she was an apprentice. A lot of trainers in your position at some point would have made a change. You would have dialed up Irad Ortiz Jr.'s uh, jockey agent, John Velasquez's agent, something like that. You've been very loyal to this young lady. Tell her, give us your take on Kylie. And was there ever any temptation to change jockeys? No, I'm, I'm not yet. I, I, and I may never, but she's fit this horse good. And we started this thing together. And I think uh, I'm pretty loyal to people if they're good. And, and I've always been that way with riders until, and she's done good. She ain't done nothing wrong. Uh, I don't, I, I want to give her a chance too. She's a really, a really good rider. She fits this horse well. She's quiet on horses. You can put her on babies that people have trouble with. And she just laid back and, and she, to get along with them. And so I've had a lot of success with her already. And I just, I think she fits this horse good. And I've had calls, different people want to ride him, but I'm like, no, I'm sticking with her. We started this together and I'd like to see her, you know, do good too. Cause I've known her a long time. Uh, she's friends of my daughter and I used to, her and her sister, we go to Lake, I'd pull them on the tubes and all that. So I've known her a long time, her family at Prairie Meadows. I've been going there for 20 years. So, I knew her when she's little. So, Tim, horse players in Arkansas, horse players in Iowa know you. You've been around. You've been around for quite a while, mostly claiming allowance horses, the occasional stake source. Now you go to the Breeders' Cup. OK, you're going to get to square off against a, a horse trained by Bob Baffert, probably in the juvenile turf sprint. Some horses from Europe, maybe Wesley Ward, Aiden O'Brien. What's it going to be like for you? Well, it's going to be different. That's for sure. <laughs> I've never had a horse of this level and, uh, I know it's a different level, but I'm only, uh, thought of this early because of the horse. And I, you know, I don't want to just go to the Breeders' Cup. I want to have a shot of, that I think is legit the horse. And, and I feel that he is a really nice horse. And so I wanted to, I've never been to Breeders' Cup personally. I've never been to the, I've, been to Keeneland, never been to Churchill, the Derby, but if I get a horse, I'll go. But, and that's why this horse, I think that he's uh, a really, really nice horse. And I think we got a shot with, because I don't know when they challenge him. I don't know. He's fast. I mean, he'll, he just gallops when they're running. So we're going to the Breeders' Cup. And I know there's some good horses. I've been hearing about them. Uh, and I'm like, well, we don't know what we got yet because he's not been, nobody's challenged this horse and not even be able to even stay with him hardly a quarter mile that he don't beat him a long ways, you know? So, and I know we're at Iowa, but we've had some decent horses come in. I know, um, uh, top recruit and some of them come in and, and he beat him pretty easy at Iowa. So yeah, I'm, I'm thinking we got a good shot in there. I like her. I like our chances. Well, we thanked him, particularly putting up with us, trying to get him to talk on his iPhone in his car. Uh, it wasn't exactly the technological genius on our part, but we want to thank Tim very much for putting up with us. And, and it's a fun story, Tim. Can't wait to see how he fares. And this horse, as I said, uh, in my writing in the Thoroughbred Daily News, he's no underdog. He's too fast to be an underdog. This is a legit horse. We can't wait to see what he does in the Breeders' Cup. Tim Martin, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Sorry, I couldn't hurt to hear, but anyway, thank you all very much, all right. okay? Thank you, Tim. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by the Green Group, an accounting and tax consulting advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Guest of the Week, Tim Martin will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at www.greencoat.com. We'll be right back after this message from the Green Group. Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes.
And now it's time for the TDN Writer's Room Weekend Preview brought to you by Three Chimneys. I got an idea, guys. Let's take a deep dive into all the stakes races that are being run this weekend. And let's extend the podcast up. What would that take? About six hours, something like that. What this is, this is a weekend to get so excited about because look at these numbers. There are 24 graded stakes races being run this weekend, 13 win in your in races and nine grade ones. This, of course, is the last big shebang before the Breeders' Cup come Sunday morning. Actually, I would say come Monday, a Sunday afternoon after all the big races are run. We'll have a pretty good idea, at least from the American horses, who's going where and what races. But you know what? I'm, I'm, more interested perhaps well i'm interested in all these races but the ones i'm really looking forward to are the joe hirsch turf classic out at aqueduct and the bell dame and uh the news broke this weekend uh that warlike goddess is going to go in the joe hirsch and it looked like kind of a uh you know just a, a ho-hum race gufo's in there obviously he's a very solid horse in this division but i think warlike goddess will really spruce things spice things up and Bill Mott is the way he's been campaigning this mayor. It's very interesting. It shows why he's a Hall of Famer. He thinks the Breeders' Cup filly and mayor turf is too short for her at a mile three sixteenths. Wants to run her in a mile and a half against the boys in the Breeders' Cup turf. So why not take on the boys beforehand in the Joe Hirsch Turf Classic? Now we record this before the the entries are out, before the PPs are out, before we have the morning line. But Randy, I think she's as good, if not better than any of the boys in this marathon turf division, at least in the U.S. I don't know what the boys are going to bring over from Europe, but right now I give her a chance, a big chance in both Saturday's race at Aqueduct, Belmont at the Big A, as well as the Breeders' Cup. I think Mott is playing his hand very sharply here. Oh, I think she is the best mile and a half turf course in America of either sex. Um, and I think she's going to be a leading contender for the Breeders' Cup turf. Of course, the, the Europeans typically dominate that race, so we'll see what they bring over. But her loss in the Flower Bowl in her last start uh, at Saratoga, I think she lost nothing at all uh, in the way of stature for that defeat because she had the most god-awful trip, a horribly, horribly slow pace. And then she was in traffic and couldn't get extricated until it was too late. Despite the fact the pace was so slow, she came charging up late and just failed to get up. So she lost nothing in defeat there. Now, Gufo's a nice horse. They both have similar running styles. They come from well back in the pack. So it'll be a nice test for Warlike Goddess. And also, both horses are maybe not as much as it would be if the race were run on dirt, but they are somewhat pace dependent. And looking at the list of probables for this race, there aren't a lot of confirmed speed horses in here. I mean, Chad Brown, of course, is always going to be tough to beat. He's got a couple on the probable possible list, uh, Ad Hamo and Rock Emperor. Uh, but, you know, Warlike Goddess, even with very little early speed in here, I think is going to be the horse to beat. Absolutely. I, I mean, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall to hear the conversation between Joel and Bill Mott after the last race. And I mean, Bill's not going to tell Joel what to do. He He's not that kind of guy, but you know, you, you're riding the one to five favorite. There are many different ways to win a horse race and only, I mean, many different ways to lose and only one way to win. So it'll be interesting, but I, I think we'll see perhaps a little bit more of a productive ride from Joel this time. And the other race I'm looking forward to at BAC, B-A-Q, the racing form abbreviation for this meet, of course, is the Bell Dame. Because, you know, Nest has been a little bit overshadowed this year because she is a filly, of course. And, you know, all the hype has been for Flightline and justifiably so in the epicenter in the male division. But let's not forget how good she is. And uh, Todd Pletcher is dividing up his two big guns for the uh, Breeders' Cup distaff with Malathat going Sunday in the Spinster Stakes at Keeneland. And, and Randy, I mean, Nest is turned into obviously the best three-year-old filly in her division. I think it's possible she's already, I wouldn't say it's possible, i say it's quite likely that she's already wrapped up the three-year-old filly Eclipse Award. And I also give Pletcher credit. He's one of the trainers that isn't ducking all these um, you know, training up to the Breeders' Cup. We're not going to run after Saratoga. He ran uh, Life is Good he, uh, in the Woodward. He's running Malathat in the Spinster. He's running Nest in in the uh, Bell Dame. Those are his three big, biggest guns among many for the Breeders' Cup uh, when it comes to Keeneland later on in November, the first week in November. So, you know, she's always, you know, again, I, the, right now, it looks like a small field. I, I don't know if she'll be 1 to 20 like Life is Good, but she'll be a huge favorite in that race. And she's exciting anytime she shows up. Oh, to me, Bill, right now, if you were to make a line for the Breeders' Cup to staff, and it's and it looks like a pretty solid race, uh, I think Nest would have to be the favorite. She has been absolutely dominating 
in her last few races. Um, she started off the season good as a three-year-old filly, obviously, and she's just gotten better and better and better as the years progress. She's got tactical speed, so she can maybe avoid some trouble early in a race. You know, she's she's got that sort of uh, ability to be wherever her rider wants her to be and to take advantage of a slow pace or sit back a little further in case the pace is fast. And and looking at the bell dame, uh, <laughs> She she definitely looks like a heavy, heavy favorite. Yeah, I basically predict predict maybe a four horse field for those facing Nest and she'll be one to nine and she'll probably park. She's actually a really cool filly to be around. She's not an overly big filly. Like sometimes you think these fillies, especially that run in the Belmont, are massive. And she's not. She's very feminine. She's got a dainty way of going. She's just a pure racehorse. She's an absolute racehorse. If you look it up in the book, you'll find a picture of her. She's amazing. It'll be interesting too. They they ran in the Belmont and they for just a minute uh, gave some thought to running in the Travers. I assume she's coming back at four. Most good fillies and mayors in this day and age do come back as four-year-olds. I wonder if they'll try the boys next year. Uh, if they pick the right spot, I would love to see that pull a Rachel Alexandra. Well, she's obviously good enough. Um, yeah. if, if, if she, Especially if she continues on this on this path of improvement, right? I mean, typically you see three-year-olds improve toward the end of the year, but not always. Sometimes they're so precocious and she was good early in the year that, that they they basically stay on the same plane throughout the three-year-old year and they don't improve. Nest is one of those horses that started good and now she's gotten better and better. And I think if they do choose to run her against the boys, I think she'd be very competitive. This TDN Riders Room in the Weekend Preview is brought to you by Three Chimneys. We heard from Tim Martin talk about his sensational two-year-old Tyler's Tribe, who's an unbeaten five-for-five five right now. Well, Tyler's Tribe is a son of Three Chimneys stallion Sharp Azteca, who currently leads this class of first crop sires in North America with 27 winners already this year. Furthermore, in the upcoming Claiborne Breeders Futurity at Keeneland, Sharp Azteca has a potential starter there in Honed, who was second last out in the grade three Iroquois stake. And another three chimney sire, Fantastic, might be represented in the Breeders' Futurity by Fantastic again. We'll be right back for part two of the weekend preview after this message from Three Chimneys. Here comes Tama. Tama in the center of the track with good looking stride. Squares off with Cyberknife. Cyberknife takes the lead. Tama going with him. These two in a thriller. Cyberknife just in front. And Cyberknife has won the TBG.com Haskell over Tama. Jack Christopher finished third. The running time, 1 minute 46.24 seconds. Come dream with us at Three Chimneys. Well, welcome back. This is the Weekend Preview brought to you by Three Chimneys. Uh, Zoe, a lot going on out at Saturday at Santa Anita. Two-year-old races in the lineup with the American Pharaoh and the Chandelier. Surprise, surprise, Bob Baffert will be front and center. What do you know about, the, first of all, the American Pharaoh? Yeah, well, Bob Baffert going to be having at least three in there. We mentioned the three amigos earlier. His trio, or maybe he's got four in there, will be led by Cave Rock, a son of Arrogate, who is undefeated. He's won his last two by multiple lengths. And it's not often that we talk about a son of Arrogate that actually looks like Arrogate. He moves like Arrogate. He just had a really good work. You can catch that on XBTV.com. And he definitely does appear a horse with a very bright future. We'll have the great one. Chandelier as well, a win and you're in for the juvenile Phillies. Looks like Buffett, Baffert may lead the roster with home cooking in there for him. And of course, the Zuma Beach. And let's just not forget the turf races. We have the grade one Rodeo Drive as well, a win and you're in for the Philly and Mare turf. So a bunch of really good races this weekend at Santa Anita. Randy, how good are these Baffert horses? They're fast, aren't they? Which hey, again, it goes without saying. I mean, K, K Rock especially. I mean, his his first two races were just off the charts. Buyer speed figures of 101 and then a 98 in the Del Mar Futurity, right? I mean, uh, he's he can run fast early and keep going. And Baffert is also very high on national treasure, right? He wanted to run national treasure at Keeneland in the Breeders' Futurity. That was his early plan. And he thought he could win both races this weekend. But because the purse money at Santa Anita is not as good as the purse money at Churchill Downs and Kentucky Downs and Saratoga, he was afraid. He was told by the, by the Keeneland Racing Office there was a pretty good chance National Treasure wouldn't be able to get in 
if in case the race is oversubscribed and it comes down to career earnings at Keeneland. So he, he called an audible opted to keep national treasure uh, there in California for the American Pharaoh. But he thinks he's in with a big shot as well. Zoe, an interesting horse in there that says Jazzy, he's a maiden, but he's got a big buyer figure, costs $3.5 million of the sales. He's got to have a shot too, doesn't he? I mean, this horse wouldn't, a maiden winning a grade one race in this case would not be a surprise. I mean, basically we're talking distance, distance, distance. Uh, he's a son of Bernardini. He's going to get better as he goes long, longer. Gary Young bought him for Zidane. Everyone got carried away that day at the sale and paid an awful lot of money for him. But anytime Baffert runs a maiden in a graded stakes race, you really have to pay attention. Didn't American Pharaoh break his maiden in a grade one race? I don't know. You threw me a curveball yeah, there. Did. I'm not really sure. <laughs> All right. So let's head out to Keeneland now. And last but certainly not least, what a big weekend of uh, racing the opening week of the fall meet at Keeneland. And uh, so many big races. We're not going to have a chance to talk about all of them. You've got the Breeders' Futurity. You've got the First Lady. You've got the Coolmore Turf Mile. Sunday, you've got the Spinster Stakes. We talked about that earlier. The race I'm looking for, and this is always a really good race, for, both from a uh, betting standpoint, because it gets a big field and, and fairly wide open. And also from just a quality standpoint is the Coolmore Turf Mile. You've got Ivor, who ran second last time out behind Modern Games in the Woodbine uh, Mile, the Rico Woodbine Mile. Some hot, like at Hot Brown, coming off a win in a stakes race at Kentucky Downs. Casa Creek coming off a win in the four-star day. Santon, the Arlington Millionaire winner coming into there. Uh, Randy, that race is going to be loaded. Your thoughts on what's going on at Keeneland this weekend? Those horses in a smooth like straight makes the trip uh, east for, for trainer Mike McCarthy. I mean, he's a seriously legitimate grade one miler as well, who has good form in past races in Kentucky. So with those horses, yeah, Ivar, I mean, I know Casa Creed is running really, really well. He's on a two race win streak uh, at a mile in graded stakes races for Belmont. Ivar's last race running second to modern games at Woodbine in the Woodbine mile, um, I, I thought was sensational. Uh, he, he got off to an even slower start than usual. He was four wide around the turn following modern games in that race. He fanned even wider at the top of the stretch. He was pushed out at about the three six seats pole when William Buick came out for room on modern games. It didn't and elbow yeah, anybody, did yeah, it? He didn't elbow anybody, but <laughs> he, he didn't make his way out. He did bull his way out. But you know, yeah, he was blown away by modern games, of course. Right. But modern games is going to be right now, I think it looks like he's going to be a pretty solid favorite for the Breeders' Cup mile. So to, to still run second in a good number, uh, for Ivar in that race, given the way his trip went, uh, I, I think he set up to run well in here. And he won this race two years ago, uh, back in 2020. Yeah, Paula Lobo really knows how to lead those good horses over for the stakes races at Keeneland. He's stabled down there. He was in Southern California for an awfully long time, and now he's stabled on Rice Road. And he's really had a very productive meet. Each and every meet, he seems to win a greater stakes. Am I, am I crazy? But does Paula Lobo not win a greater stakes every Keeneland meet? Yeah, the two-year-old races are also going to be front and center, guys. You got the Alcibiades on Friday and the Claiborne Breeders' Futurity on Saturday. The Breeders' Futurity, I mentioned, National Treasure is not making the trip. Uh, Baffert called an audible and is putting Newgate on the plane along with Carmel Road to come to Keeneland and face hopeful winner Forte, who was flattered, of course, by the win in the hopeful uh, by Chad Brown's horse uh, on, on Saturday. So you've also got a horse in there by the name of Lost Ark from the Todd Pletcher barn, who is a half brother to Nest and who is also in very good form right now. Alcibiades, fun and feisty, uh, looked really, really good winning the Pocahontas. Figure wasn't all that good, but visually nice move on the second turn. Very impressive. So those races are interesting to me as well. Yeah, once again, it's a spectacular weekend. Once again, here are the numbers. 24 graded stakes races, 13 winning your ins, and nine grade ones, all major preps for the Breeders' Cup. So it should be a fascinating and very exciting and very meaningful weekend on the American racing scene this weekend. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtb.com. Here's a message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life. Make new friends. 
and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. Being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse every step of the way. When it comes to being at the sales ground, showing your horses, we are with your horse. Just driving up and down the road every day, there's not a time that I don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport, the animal, the people that come to invest in the game. I want to see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world. The TDN Riders Room is brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think 50 years of combined experience in the horse business could benefit your program, give Tommy or Wendy a call. They personally advise you on each horse as if they were their own. Meanwhile, the Phasic Tipton Kentucky October yearling sale is three weeks away, and Legacy has almost 50 yearlings cataloged for the auction by first crop sires, preservationists, enticed, Matole, audible, as well as young sires with runners excelling on the track like Mendelssohn, Practical Joke, and Good Samaritan. Well, that's a wrap. Randy, before we go, we'll be seeing you on the airwaves this weekend. Yeah, we've got a couple of shows on NBC Saturday and Sunday uh, from the studio, but dealing with the Keeneland races uh, on Saturday, we'll have the Claiborne Breeders Futurity and the Coolmore Turf Mile. Sunday, we'll have the Bourbon and the Spinster, where Malafat goes up against Latruska, 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern, both days, Saturday and Sunday. All right, team, for our first race over the track, I think we did pretty well. I want to thank both Randy Moss and Zoe Cabman. Of course, I want to thank our producer, Patty Wolf, our assistant and associate producer, Katie Petruniak, our editors, Nathan Wilkinson and Leah and Anthony LaRocca. Bill Finley for the TDN Writers Room. Thanks for joining us. Talk to you again soon. <laughs>